Chapter 17, Humorous Ghost Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Haunted Photograph by Ruth McIrney Stewart. To the ordinary observer, it was a common photograph of a cheap summer hotel. It hung sumptuously framed in plush over the widow Morris's mantle, the one resplendent note in an otherwise modest home in a characteristic Queen Anne village. One had only to see the rapt face of its owner as she sat in her weeds before the picture, which she tearfully pronounced a striking likeness to sympathize with the townsfolk who looked askance at the bereaved woman even while they bore with her illusion feeling sure that her sudden sorrow had set her mind agog when she had received the picture through the mail some months before the fire which consumed the hotel a fire through which she had not passed but out of which she had come a widow she proudly passed it around among the friends waiting with her at the post office, replying to their questions as they admired it. Oh, yes, that's where he works, if you can call it work. He's the head steward in it, and all that row of windows where you see the awnings down, there he is, and them that ain't down, they's his too. That is to say, it's his jurisdiction. You see, he's got the whip hand over the cook and the storeroom, and that key don't go out of his belt unless he knows who's getting what, and he's firm. Morris always was. He's like the iron law of the Ephesians. What key? It was an old lady who held the picture at arm's length, the more closely to scan it, who asked the question. She asked it partly to know, as neither man nor key appeared in the photograph, and partly to parry the historic illusion, a disturbing sort of fire for which Mrs. Morris was rather noted, and which made some of her most loyal townsfolk a bit shy of her. Oh, I ain't referring to the pictures, she hastened to explain. I mean the keys that he always carries in his belt. The regular joke is to call him St. Peter, and he takes it in good part, for he declares that there's such a thing as a similitude to the kingdom of heaven and a hotel, why it's the providential supply department which in a manner hangs to his belt. He always humors a joke, especially on himself. No one will ever know through what painful periods of unrequited longing the widow Morris had sought solace in this her only cherished relic. After the half hour of skyworks which had made her, in her own vernacular, a lonely conflagrated widow with a heart full of ashes, before the glad moment when it was given her to discern in it an unsuspected and novel value, first had come, as a faint gleam of comfort, the reflection that although Though her dear lost one was not in evidence in the picture, he had really been inside the building where the photograph was taken, and so, of course, he must be in there yet. At first she experienced a slight disappointment that her man was not visible at door or window, but it was only a passing regret. It was really better to feel him surely and broadly within, at large in the great house, free to pass at will from one room to another. To have had him fixed, no matter how effectively, would have been a limitation. As it was, she pressed the picture to her bosom as she wondered if, perchance, he would not some day come out of his hiding to meet her. It was a muffled pleasure and tremulously entertained at first, but the very whimsicality of it was an appeal to her sensitized imagination, and so, when finally the thing did really happen, it is a small wonder that it came somewhat as a shock. It appears that one day, feeling particularly lonely and forlorn, and having no other comfort, she was pressing her tear-stained face against the row of window shutters in the room without awnings. 
this being her nearest approach to the alleged occupant's bosom, when she was suddenly startled by a peculiar swishing sound, as of wind-blown rain, whereupon she lifted her face to perceive that it was indeed raining, and then, glancing back at the photograph, she distinctly saw her husband rushing from one window to another, drawing down the sashes on the side of the house that would have been exposed to the real shower whose music was in her ears. This was a great discovery, and naturally enough, it set her weeping, for she sobbed it made her feel for a minute that she had lost her widowhood and that after the shower he'd be coming home. It might well make one anyone cry to suddenly lose the pivot upon which his emotions are swung. At any rate, Mrs. Morris cried. She said that she cried all night, first because it seemed so spooky to see him whose remains she had so recently buried on faith, waving recognition in the debris, dashing about in so matter-of-fact a way. And then she wept because, after all, he did not come. This was the formal beginning of her sense of personal companionship in the picture. Companionship, yes, of delight in it, for there is even delight in tears, in some situations in life. Especially is this true of one whose emotions are her only guides, as seems to have been the case with the widow Morris. After seeing him draw the window sashes, and he had drawn them down, ignoring her presence, she sat for hours waiting for the rain to stop. It seemed to have set in for a long spell, for when she finally fell asleep from sheer disappointment, long towards morning, it was still raining, but when she awoke, the sun shone, and all the windows in the picture were up again. This was a misleading experience, however, for she soon discovered that she could not count upon any line of conduct by the man in the hotel, as the fact that it had one time rained in the photograph at the same time that it rained outside was but a coincidence and she was soon surprised to perceive all quiet along the hotel piazza, not even an awning flapping while the earth on her plane was torn by storms. On one memorable occasion when her husband had appeared, flapping the window panes from within with a towel, she had thought for one brief moment that he was beckoning to her, and that she might have to go to him, and she was beginning to experience terror, with shortness of breath and other premonitions of sudden passing, when she discovered that he was merely killing flies, and she flurriedly fanned herself with the asbestos mat which she had seized from the stove beside her, and staggered out to a seat under the mulberries as she stammered, I do declare, Morris will be the death of me yet, He's most as much cared to me dead as he was alive. I made sure, made sure he'd come after me. Then, feeling her own fidelity challenged, she hastened to add, Not that I hadn't rather go to him than take any trip in the world, but, but I never did fancy that hotel, and since I've got used to seeing him there so constant, I feel sure that's where we'd end up. My brief belief is, anyway, that if there's hereafters for some things, there's hereafters for all. For what can I gather? I reckon I'm a kind of cross between a Swedenborgan and a Gates ajar. That, of course, engrafted onto a Methodist. Now, that hotel, when it was consumed by fire, which to it was the same as mortal death, why, it either ascended into heaven in smoke, or it fell in ashes to the other place. If it died worthy, like as not, it's undergoing repairs now for a mansion, Jasper Coppola's, and, but, of course, such as that could be run up in a twinkling. Still, from what I've heard, it's more likely gone down to its deserts. 
It would seem hard for a hotel with so many odd-off corridors and palmed embrasures with teetered sofas to live along without sin. She stood on her stepladder, wiping the face of the picture as she spoke, and as she began to back down, she discovered the cat under her elbow, glaring at the picture. Yes, Kitty, spit away, she exclaimed. Like as not, you see even more than I do. And as she slipped the ladder back into the closet, she remarked this to herself strictly. If it hadn't have been for poor puss, I'd have had a heap more pleasure out of this picture than what I have had or would be likely to have again. The way she's taken on, I've almost come to hate it. A serpent had entered her poor little Eden. Even the green-eyed monster constrictor, who, if given full swing, would not spare a bone of her meager comfort. A neighbor who had chanced to come in at the time, unobserved, overheard the last remark, and Mrs. Morris, seeing that she was there, continued in an unchanged tone while she gave her a chair. Of course, Miss Withers, you can easily guess who I refer to. I mean that comely featured wench that kept the books and answered the telephone at the hotel when she found the time from her meddling. Somehow, I never thought about her being burned in with Morris till Puss give her away. Puss never did like the girl when she was alive, and the first time I see her scratch and spit, at the picture, just the way she used to do whenever she come in sight, why it just struck me like a clap of thunder out of a clear sky that Puss knew who she was spitting at. And I switched around sudden and glanced up sudden, and, well, what I seen, I seen. There was that beautied up typewriter setting in the windowsill of Morris's butler's pantry, and if she didn't wink at me malicious, then I don't know malicious when I see it. And she used her fingers against her nose, too, most defiant and impolite. So I says to Puss, I says, Puss, I says, there's goings on in that hotel sure as fate. Annabelle Bender has got the better of me for once. And tell the truth, it did spoil the photograph for me for a while, for, of course, after that, if I didn't see him somewheres on the watch for his faithful spouse, I'd say to myself, he's inside there with that pink-featured hussy. You know, a man's a man, Miss Withers, especially Morris, and with his lawful wife cut off and indefinitely divorced by a longevity family and another burned in with him, well... His faithfulness is put to a trial by fire, as you might say. So as I say, it spoiled the picture for me for a while. And to make matters worse, it wasn't any time before I recollected that Campbellite preacher that was burned in with them. And with that, my imagination run riot. And I'd think to myself, if they're inclined, they certainly have things handy. Then I'd catch myself and say, Where's your faith in Scripture, Mary Martha Matthews, n named after two Bible women and born daughter to an apostle? What's the use, I'd say. And so, first and last, I'd get a sort of alpha and omega comfort of the passage about no giving in marriage. Still, there'd be times, pray as I would, when them three would loom up him and her, and the Campbellite preacher. I know his license to marry would run out in time, but for eternity, of course we don't know. Seems like everything would last forever. And then again, if I've got a widow's freedom, Morris must be classed as a widower, if anything. Then I'd get some relief in thinking about his disposition. Good as he was, Morris was fickle-tasted. Not in the long run, but day in and day out. And even if he'd have taken up with her, he'd get a distaste the minute he realized she'd be there interminable. That's Morris. Why, didn't he get used to get nervous just seeing me around? And me his own selected. And didn't I used to make some excuse to send him over to May Matters Ma's Ma? So he's 
be harmlessly diverted. She was full of talk, and she was 90-odd and asthmatic, but he'd come home from them visits and call me his child wife. I've had my happy moments. You know a man will get tired of himself, even if he's condemned to it, too continual, and think of that blonde-netted typewriter for a steady diet. To a man like Morris, imagine her when her hair dye started to give out. Green streaks in that pompadour. So knowing my man, I'd take courage, and I'd think, seeing me cut off, he'd soon be wanting me more than ever, and so he does. If he's got so now that glance up at that hotel any time I will, I can generally find him on the lookout, and many's the time I've stole in and put a favorite apron of his on with blue bows on it when we'd be alone and nobody to remark about me breaking my morning. Dear me, how full of buoyancy he was, a regular boy at 35 when he passed away. Was it any wonder that her friends exchanged glances while Mrs. Morris entertained them in so droll a way? Still, as time passed, and she not only brightened in the light of her delusion, but proceeded to meet the conditions of her own life by opening a small shop in her home, and when she exhibited a wholesome sense of profit and loss, her neighbors were quite ready to accept her in terms of mental responsibility. With occupation and a modest success, emotional disturbance was surely giving place to an even calm when one day something happened. Mrs. Morris sat behind her counter, sorting notions, puss asleep beside her when she heard the swish of thin silk with a breath of familiar perfume, and looking up, Whom did she see but the blonde lady of her troubled dreams striding bodily up to the counter, smiling as she swished? At the sight, the good woman first rose to her feet and then suddenly dropped, flopped, breathless and white, backward and had to be revived, so that for the space of some minutes things happened very fast. That is, if we may believe the flurried testimony of the blonde, who in going over it two hours later, had more than once to stop for breath. Well, say, she panted, did you ever? Such a turn as took her. I had no more stepped in the door when she succumbed, green as the Ganges, into her own egg basket, and it full and she was on the eve of flopping back into the pruning scissors points up when I scrambled over the counter, breaking my straight front in two, which she's welcome to, poor poor thing. Then I loaned her my smelling salts, which she held her breath against until it got to be a case of smell or die, and she smelled. Then it was a case of temporary spasms for a minute, the salt spilling out over her face. But when the accident evaporated and she opened her eyes rational, I thought to myself, maybe she don't know she's killed and would be humiliated if she did. So I acted callous and I says offhand like I says, pushing her apron around behind her over its vice versa so as to cover up the eggs which I thought had better be broke to her gently. I says, I just called in, Miss Morris, to borrow your recipe for angel cake or maybe get you to bake one for us. I knew she baked on orders. And with that, what does she do but go over again, limp as wet starch, down and through every egg in that basket, solid and fluid. Well... By this time, a man who'd seen her at her first and run for a doctor, he come in with three. And whilst they were bowing to each other and backing, I give her stimulus, and directly she turned upon me one rememberable gaze, and she says, Doctor, she says, 
Would you think they'd have the gall to try to get me to cook for them? They've ordered angel ca- And with that, over she toppled again, no pulse, nor nothing, same as the dead. While the blonde talked, she busied herself with her loosely falling locks, which she tried vainly to entrap. And yet you say she ain't classed as crazy? I'd say it of her, sure. And so old Morris is dead. Burned in that old hotel. Well, well, poor old fella. Poor dear old place. What times I've had. She spoke through a mouthful of gilt hairpins, and her voice was as an aeolian harp. And he burned in it, and she's a widow yet. Yes, I did hear there'd been a fire, but you never can tell. I thought the chimney might have burned out, and I was in the thick of being engaged to the night clerk at the Singing Needles Hotel in Pineville at the time, and there's no regular mail there. I thought the story might be exaggerated. Oh, no, I didn't marry the night clerk. I'm a bride now, married to the head steward. Same rank as poor old Morris, and we're just as happy. I used to plague Morris about her hair, but I have to let up on that now. Mine's as red again as hers. No, not my hair, mine's hair. It's as red as a flannel drawer, every bit in grain. But, say, she added presently, when she gets better, just tell her never mind about that recipe. I copied it off of her recipe book while she was under the weather and dropped a dime in her cash box. I recollect how old Morris used to look forward to her angel cakes, weekends he'd be going home. And you know, there's nothing like having ammunition in marriage, even if you never need it. Mine's in that frame of mine now that transforms my gingerbread into angel cake. But the time may come when I'll have to beat my eggs to a fluff, even for angel cake, so's not to have it taste like gingerbread to him. Oh, no, he's not with me this trip. I just run down for a lark to show my folks my ring and things and let them see it's really so. He gives me considerable jewelry. His first tastes run that way, and they ain't no children. Yes, this amethyst is the wedding ring. I selected that on account of being a widower, him being a widower. It's the nearest I'd come to wearing mor- second mourning for a woman I can't exactly grieve after. The year not being up is why he stayed home this trip. He didn't like to be seen traversing the same old haunts with another till it was up. I wouldn't wait because, tell the truth, I was afraid. He ain't like a married man with me about money yet, and it's liable to seize him any day. He might say that he couldn't afford the trip or that we couldn't, which would amount to the same thing. I rather liked him being a little ticklish about going around with me for a while. It's one thing to do a thing and another to be brazen about it. But if she don't get better, the reversion was to the widow Morris, if she doesn't if she don't get a mind, poor thing, there's a fine insane asylum just out of Pineville, and I'd like the best in the world to look out for her. It would make an excuse for me to go in. They say they have high old times there. Some days they let the inmates do most any old thing that's harmless. They give them unpoisonous paints and let them paint each other up. One man insisted he was a barber pole and ringed himself accordingly, and then another chased him around for a stick of peppermint candy. Think of all that inside a close fence and a town so dull and news-hungry. Yes, they say Thursdays is paint days, and of course Fridays they are scrub days. They pass around turpentine and hide the matches, but of course Miss Morris may get the better of it. Tain't every woman that can stand widowing, and sometimes them has got the least out of marriage will seem the most deprived to lose it, so they say. The blonde was a person of words. When Mrs. Morris finally revived, and after restoring night's sleep, had got her bearings, and when she realized clearly that 
her supposed rival had actually shown up in the flesh, she visibly braced up. Her neighbors understood that it must have been a shock to be suddenly confronted with any souvenir of the hotel fire. So one had expressed it, and the incident soon passed out of the village mind. It was not long after this incident that the widow confided to a friend that she was coming to depend upon Morris for advice in her business. Standing as he does in that hotel door, between two worlds, as you might say, why he sees both ways, and oftentimes he'll detect an event on the way to happening. And if it doesn't move too fast, why I can hustle and get the better of things. It was as if she had a private wire for advanced information, and she declared herself happy. Indeed, a certain ineffable light, such as we sometimes see in the eyes of those newly in love, came to shine from the face of the widow, who did not hesitate to affirm, looking into space as she said it. Taking all things into consideration, I can truly say that I've never been so truly and ideally married since my widowhood. And she smiled as she added, Marriage, the earthly way, is vicissitudious, for everybody knows that anything is liable to happen to a man at large. There had been a time when she lamented that her picture was not life-size, as it would seem so much more natural, but she immediately reflected that the hotel would never have gotten into her little house, and that, after all, the main thing was having him under her roof. As the months passed, Mrs. Morris, albeit she seemed severe and of peaceful mind, grew very white and still. Fire is white in its ultimate intensity. The top, spinning its fastest, is said to sleep, and the dancing dervish is still. So, misleading signs sometimes mark the danger line. Under-eating and overthinking was what the doctor said while he felt her translucent wrist and prescribed nails in her drinking water. If he secretly knew that kind of nature was gently letting down the bars so that a waiting spirit might easily pass, well, he was a doctor, not a minister. His business was with the body, and he ordered repairs. She was only 37, and well, when she passed painlessly out of life. It seemed to be simply a case of going. There were several friends at her bedside the night she went, and to them she turned, feeling the time come. I just wanted to give out that the first thing I intend to do when I'm relieved is to call by there for Morris. She lifted her weary eyes to the picture as she spoke for Morris, and I want it understood that it'll be a vacant house from the minute I depart. So if there's any other woman that's calculating to have any carryings on from them windows, while well, she'll be disappointed, she or they. The one obnoxious person I thought it was, I thought was in it wasn't. My imagination was tempted of Satan, and I was misled. So it must be sold just for what it is, just a photographer's photograph. If it's a picture with a past, why, everybody knows what that past is and will respect it. I have to conquer myself enough to bequeath it to the young lady I suspicioned. But human nature is frail, and I can't quite do it although doubtless she would like it as a souvenir. Maybe she'd find it a little too souvenirish to suit my wifely taste. And yet, if a person's going to die, I suppose I might legate it to her, partly to recompense her for her discretion in leaving that hotel when she did, and partly for undue suspicion. There's a few debts to be paid, but there's eggs and things that'll pay them. And there's no need to have the hen sitting in the window showcase any longer. 
It was a good advertisement, but I've often thought it might be embarrassing to her. She was growing weaker, but she roused herself to amend. Better raffle the picture for a dollar a chance and let the proceeds go to my funeral. And I want to be buried in the hotel fire general grave, commingled with him and what's left over after the debts are paid I bequeath to her to make amends. And if she don't care to come for it, let every widow in town draw for it, but she'll come. Most any woman will take any trip if it's paid for. But look, she raised her eyes excitedly toward the mantel. Look, what's that he's waving? It looks, oh yes, it is. It's our wings, two pair, mine a little smaller. I suppose it'll be the same old story. I'll never be able to keep up, to keep up with him. And I've been so happy. Yes, Morris, I'm coming. And she was gone into a peaceful sleep from which she easily passed just before dawn. When all was well over, the sitting women rose with one accord and went to the mantel where one even lighted an extra candle more clearly to scan the mysterious picture. Finally, one said, You may think I'm queer, but it does look different to me already. So it does, said another, taking the candle, like a house for rent. I declare it gives me the cold shivers. I'll pay my dollar gladly and take a chance for it, whispered a third, but I wouldn't let such a thing as that enter my happy home. Neither would I, nor me neither. I've had trouble enough. My husband's first wife's portrait has brought me discord enough, and it was a straight likeness. I don't want any more pictures to put in the hen house for loft. So the feeling ran among the wives. Well, said she, who was blowing out the candle, I'll draw for it and take it if I win it and consider it a sort of inheritance. I never inherited anything but indigestion. The last speaker was a maiden lady, and so it was she who answered chuckling. That's what I say, anything for a change. There'll be some excitement in a picture where a man was liable to show up. It's more than I've got now. I do declare it's just scandalous the way we're giggling and the poor soul hardly out of hearing. She had a kind heart, Miss Morris had, and she made herself happy with a mighty slim chance. Yes, she did, and I only wish there'd been a better man waiting for her in that hotel. End of chapter 17. Recorded by Rusty Dancer.